Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is Left Bank Books Presents Online, University of Illinois at Chicago professor John D'Amelio, who will discuss his new book, Queer Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives. And tonight he will be in conversation with St. Louis LGBTQIA plus history author, Stephen Lewis Brawley. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We celebrated 51 years this year. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of John and Stephen, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We have adapted to the current situation. We are bringing you um, events virtually like this. So you are experiencing one of the things that we have used to adapt. We also have curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. As of tonight, we are opening up for evening appointments by uh, for shopping in the store. So you can make an appointment on our website, left-bank.com. We hope that you enjoy this event and we hope that you support John and Stephen and Left Bank Books by purchasing a, a copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. Uh, both books are available for sale. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff here through the most unusual of times. It is incredibly important right now that you are supporting uh, stores like Left Bank Books, other local bookstores, other uh, local restaurants and places that you enjoy because it is incredibly hard for everyone uh, in business during this time. So your support is incredibly appreciated and we thank you for doing that. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from the audience at the end of the event, so you can type those up as a comment at any point in time in the conversation, and we will get to those at the end. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events and everything that's going on at the bookstore. We have a lot of exciting things happening for the holidays. The variety of LGBTQ life in Chicago is too abundant and too diverse to be contained in a single place. But since 1981, the Gerber Hart Library and Archives has striven to do just that, amassing a wealth of records related to the city's gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer identified people and organizations. In Queer Legacies, John D'Amelio, a pioneering scholar in the field, digs deep into Gerber Hart's collection to unearth a kaleidoscopic look at the communities built by generations of LGBTQ people. Excavated from one of the country's most important yet overlooked LGBTQ archives, D'Amelio's entertaining and enthusiastic essays range in focus from politics and culture to social life, academia, and religion. He gives readers an inclusive and personal look at 50 years of a national fight for visibility, recognition, and equality led by LGBTQ Americans who quite literally made history. In these troubled times, it will surely inspire a new generation of scholars and activists. John D'Amelio is Professor Emeritus of History and Gender and Women's Studies at University of Illinois at Chicago. A Guggenheim Fellow and a pioneer in the field of gay and lesbian studies, he is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous books, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, and Intimate Matters, which was cited in Justice Anthony Kennedy's uh, opinion in Lawrence v. Texas, the 2003 Supreme Court case overturning U.S. anti-sodomy laws. Both are also published by the University of Chicago Press. And tonight, John will be in conversation with author Stephen Lewis Brawley, who is a historian specializing in LGBT topics. In 2007, he founded the St. Louis LGBT History Project in an effort to help preserve and promote the region's LGBT uh, legacy. The St. Louis community has rallied behind the project, helping amass and archive a rich collection of artifacts and photographs that offer a window into the vibrant LGBT past of St. Louis. Images of America, Gay and Lesbian St. Louis features photographs from project donors, the Missouri History Museum, the State Historical Society Museum, local newspapers, and private collections. And I am partic particularly proud that Left Bank Books is featured as just a page in that uh, book. So you too can learn about uh, Chicago and St. Louis uh, LGBT history tonight. And now I am very proud and very happy to welcome John D'Amelio 
and Stephen Lewis Raleigh for Left Bank Books. If everyone at home would please help me in giving them a giant round of applause. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We have a great crowd here tonight, so they are eager for the conversation. I will go ahead and pass it off to you, and I will see you in a little bit for the, for the audience Q&A. Great. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Shane, so much. And we really applaud Left Bank for the superb job you've done um, during COVID to bring, to, to bring online programming um, on almost a daily basis. Sometimes it's just amazing the breadth of programming that you're offering. And so um, we're happy to be here tonight and to support um, Left Bank Books and to uh, make sure people um, are aware of your new um, um, arrangement with ours. So we're happy to be here to promote that. So um, um, I'm so honored to be with John tonight. Um, we have never met in person, so it's, it's great to meet um, in this virtual platform. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a great admirer of John and his work. And so I'm really um, excited to spend a few minutes um, talking about his new book and kind of finding out a little bit more about his journey and the process of putting this book together. So John, let's just start with um, a baseline question of um, what inspired you to do this particular format for the book? Well, it's, you know, it didn't start as a book. It started as a set of blog posts on a, a website, outhistory.org. And my goal was to uh, make people get excited about the process of research and discovery, uh, to show people that it isn't, you know, it's not just professionals who do research, but anybody can walk into a community archive like the Gerber Hart Library and discover amazingly wonderful, interesting, and surprising things. So what I do is I would find one collection, um, for instance, the Melissa Ann Mary collection. And I would go through it uh, and look for things that were interesting and exciting. And then I would write up a short essay that tells some of her story. And she was a major bisexual activist in the late 80s and early 90s. And the research in her archives just revealed to me, wow, this was an amazingly intense period of bisexual activism. Anyway, after doing maybe seven or eight of these, I realized, oh wait, this could be a book. Uh, you know, in fact, I could keep going through these different collections and compile a set, as I end up doing, of 38 short essays that each tell a different story, sometimes about a person, sometimes about an organization, uh, sometimes about a very exciting campaign uh, that made a big difference. Uh, most of the work is about Chicago because that's what Gerber Hart preserves. Uh, but some of the things relate to national events as well. Anyway, it, be, it was just very, very exciting. And the essays tell the story, but they also make reference to how exciting it was to learn this piece of information or see this flyer which got distributed and things like that. It might be helpful just to give a brief overview of Gerber Hart um, because it's important to understand um, how large the collection is and um, the, the amount of material that you had to kind of um, weed through to find these stories. Right. Um, so the Gerber Hart Library and Archives was founded in 1981 in Chicago uh, as a community-based project to preserve local and regional LGBTQ history. Um, and it was done until very recently. It has been done entirely with volunteer labor uh, rather than paid staff, and really by people uh, farming their individual contacts in the communities to say, well, you were very involved in this campaign. Do you have any records you'd like to, you know, give to Gerber Hart? Uh, at this point, Gerber Hart has probably something like 150 different archival collections. Some are simply one box of materials. Some are 20 or 30 boxes in size. Um, and they range from materials that go back to the 50s and 60s 
uh, to things that happened in the early 21st century. And it, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's correspondence, but it's also flyers. It's uh, T-shirts that were designed for demonstrations, uh, little buttons that were distributed that people wore at pride marches and things like that. Wonderful stuff. I know you've been associated with the library for a while. Um, as you did your research, um, and this could be a good guesstimate, out of the out of the topics in the book, how many of those would you say were fairly new stories to you? Uh, well, in a sense, most of them were. Okay. Uh, like one of the stories that I write about wasn't new to me. It was about the 1987 March on Washington, which brought 500,000 LGBT people to Washington, D.C. And so I looked at what Chicago did to contribute to it. But other things I had never heard of. For instance, one of the chapters is, uh, one of the essays is about what I label and what was labeled at the time as the gay mass. And it was an effort by activists in the early 1970s, like within a year or two after Stonewall, to uh, find a Catholic priest who would be willing to say mass to an, at that time, lesbian and gay audience. And I thought, oh my God, there, was a pre there were priests in Chicago who were willing to do this? And, and what I learned through that, that collection and another collection about Dignity, which was an organization of LGBT Catholics, is that in the 70s, there were a lot of Catholic bishops and priests that were quite receptive to working in a non-condemnatory -con way with gay and lesbian Catholics. And, you know, I had never realized that that was true. Uh, so it was exciting to discover material like this. Um, in today's world, we're used to Zoom and virtual platforms. And so a lot of the interviews and oral histories that you were researching in the archives, um, we were talking before the, um, we started, um, were, were written transcripts that you had to call through. So you right. might have heard the person's voice but you are reading a transcript, maybe describe the writing process on using transcripts to create these stories. Well, it's, you know, in a, in a certain way, um, it may be less, quote, interesting to read a transcript than actually hear a recording or watch a video. But in terms of doing research, reading a transcript is much more effective because it's like you can easily find the quotes that are right there that you want to take out and all, also the facts. And one of the most interesting interviews that I read, which again was a complete surprise, was an interview with uh, Robin Dupre, who was uh, a trans woman who did what was described in the community as female impersonation. She performed on the stage. Um, and it's, this was an interview that was done by a graduate student who found Robin's work and life amazingly interesting. And it talked about how Robin started as a teenager in the 1960s, sneaking out of her house where she lived with her family to go to gay bars where they had female impersonation and realizing this is who I am and this is who I want to be. And then she had a life of like almost, you know, 40 plus years of performance uh, in which she trained whole new generations of younger performers and trans women uh, to have the lives that they wanted to have. And reading the interview was, uh, I would, yes, I would love to have heard her voice, but reading the interview was so powerful in terms of being able to write about her story. Um, the book marvelously weaves together so many different types of topics and stories, um, politics, religion, um, activism. Um, I, I love the opening story on Merle um, and it kind of sets the tone for the book. Um, I guess a question would be, 
Um, what would you see as some common themes that th that thread the chapters together? Um, the well, one theme uh, that I think threads things together is that individuals can really make a difference. Uh, you know, we grow up. You know, I grew up in a working class family. Nobody had ever gone to college or anything. And you're just supposed to live life. And here are lots of people who grew up just supposedly living life, but then their identity and the oppression they face push them uh, to do things. Like one example I'll give uh, is the uh, lawyer, Rini Hanover, um, who, you know, she was a lawyer. She could have just had a regular life as a lawyer. Uh, but because she was a lesbian and saw the oppression around her, she decided in the 1960s before Stonewall that she was not going to let the police get away with the things they were doing. And she began defending uh, and taking on cases of police harassment and entrapment. And she would do it pro bono. Well, it made a huge difference in the lives of countless numbers of gay men who were arrested by the police. And you see that in organization after organization and in individual life histories, that people who were just kind of growing up in working class and lower middle class families make a shift at some point to activism because of something that happens to them. And they are able, working with others, to really make change. Uh, so I would say that's, an, for me, that's a very kind of important theme. Um, there are probably others, and they may come to me. But <laughs> uh, yeah, do you, do you have another question, or should I think more about this one? Uh, I, I, well, I will. Yeah. And that is, you know, ordinarily, uh, we think of activism in a kind of box and activism is very political. You know, like you engage in a, a campaign to get someone elected or you demonstrate in front of the city council and you know, you register voters. But one of the, what, several of my chapters are essays about cultural work in the community. Uh, for instance, the people who formed athletic groups in Chicago or lesbians who formed um, uh, choirs and singing groups. And one of the things that comes out very clearly is that a lot of these social or recreational or cultural activities that groups of people engage in have an important effect because they helped build a community that then is better prepared to mobilize in the political sphere. Um, the Front Runners Organization and the Metropolitan Sports Association in Chicago start off as people who just want to, you know, play volleyball or go on five, you know, five mile runs. And at a certain point, they begin raising money for AIDS. And help AIDS organizations thrive in the 80s and 90s. So this was this comes out very clearly to me that activism uh, is much more fluid than we think it is. Great, thank you. Great. Um, I'm sure for every story that made it into the book, there are just you know hundreds of that you um, were, were not able to either put into the book or you, you know you you had to make a mental note to think about ways to use the research another way. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of, of having um, an archive and we're seeing archives luckily begin to take hold across America. It's no longer just you know San Francisco or New York, but you know in Chicago, but across America, including here in St. Louis, there's real grassroots efforts and there's real formal efforts with universities and um, museums to do the work. And so I think it's important to maybe mention um, you know, how important archives are because there are thousands of these stories sitting on shelves across America and they need to come to the light of day. Yes, yes. And there are many stories 
that for everyone who's listening tonight, there are many stories that are not yet in the archives, uh, that people right. across generation who have done interesting things, who are, have had eye-opening life experiences, uh, their lives are worth documenting and preserving those documents. Uh, I mean, I could have never written this book if uh, individuals and organizations hadn't made the decision to donate materials to a place like Gerber Hart. And there are many, many other stories that will get lost if we don't continue to do the work of archiving. And one of the things I'm hoping is that uh, people who read Queer Legacies will get a sense of the importance of preserving our stories uh, and that it will motivate people to donate their own materials or encourage other people to donate materials to local archives. Um, and so again, you know, while your book does focus on Chicago centric topics, it really does help folks like myself to look at um, how you approached it and think through ways to replicate um, the thinking around um, ensuring that, that these stories, as you mentioned, the ones that are recorded or written down, but those that are yet to be um, um, put pen to paper or on Zoom or whatever new format we'll be using to do these interviews um, because there's gonna be um, uh, new technology that will allow us to maybe do it easier. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. And that's, I mean, I think that's something that archives, you know, from the Library of Congress to the Gerber Hart Library are all trying to figure out, like, what, sh now that we're living in a digital age, where so much of what happens isn't documented on paper, but it's documented on our computers and lives in the cloud, uh, how do archives adapt to that? And how do we save those materials and make sure they're preserved? And it's a challenge that archives and historians are facing right now uh, to figure it out. I mean, most of the stuff that I've written about uh, in this book is pre the intensely digital age that we live in. So, so I wasn't having to deal with that yet, but. Uh, if I live a really long life and start writing about the 2000s and 2010s and 2020s, uh, I'm going to have to deal with, you know, the digitization of our records and our information. Um, the Supreme Court has been on a lot of people's minds the last few weeks. Um, and so when Shane did the introduction and he mentioned um, one of your books being um, referenced in one of the decisions at the, the Supreme Court level, um, can you kind of maybe give me a feeling for when when you f first found out that that had occurred? What was your reaction to that? Well, and it's an interesting story because the day of the Supreme Court decision, it happened during a week when I and a group of LGBT historians were gathered at the Kinsey Institute in Indiana doing research and doing programming together. And we knew that that morning the Supreme Court was going to announce his decision. So at a certain point, we all came together. We were sitting in the Kinsey Library and there was a TV there and we watched and we heard the decision delivered and, oh my God, we were beside ourselves. But almost immediately, you know, like within an hour of the decision coming down, it was available online to read. And so we're sitting there, each of us at our computers reading it. And here I see the citation to intimate matters and how the argument of intimate matters was built into Justice Kennedy's uh, decision and the opinion that he wrote. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> I had no idea this would ever happen. But uh, it, it, it gave me a feeling that, oh, history can make a difference. It isn't just about learning about the past, but somehow learning about the past can actually influence what happens in the present. So it was a very exciting moment. What's your um, feeling about the overall field of study on um, LGBTQIA history? Um, I know it's come a long way the last 20 years. Um, groups such as the Organization of American Historians has um, 
started track now at their conferences and I was fortunate to participate in one of those here in St. Louis a couple years back. Um, do you believe the field is continuing to um, grow and prosper and um, getting more of a foothold in academia? Well, yes. I mean, and there's, I, well, I, <clears throat> I have two kind of versions of how to answer that. One is that as a field of history in the world of historians, there's no question that LGBTQ history is growing. I mean, once upon a time, you could read every book on LGBTQ history in a summer and still have time for a long vacation. Now, I can't keep up with all the books that are being published, even in US history, let alone you know more widely. So that's a really, really wonderful thing. The problem that currently needs to be addressed, however, is that that history isn't circulating widely yet. I mean, I, I retired five years ago, so I don't know what's been ha what's if it's changed in the last five years. But even in those last years of teaching, like 2012, 13, 14, uh, one of the things that was amazing was that the college students who came to my classes, no matter what their identities unless they were very self-defined already as activists. So, you know, two students out of 40, none of them knew any LGBT history and it had never come up in any other class that they had taken. Mm -hmm. And it was only either in high school or in college. And it was only because there was a LGBT history course that they finally learned things. So part of my motivation in writing a book that consists of short independent essays is that I wanted to write a book that's very easy to read. Um, for instance, I honestly, I think that high school students could read this book and, and rather than, and not feel overwhelmed by it because you can read a five page essay for 10 minutes and then put it down and then go back to another one. So that's our challenge. The, the academic world is being very supportive and we need to figure out how to get it further out into the world. Um, most authors have another book um, in the back of their mind. Um, what's your what's noodling around um, in your head for your next book? Uh, the uh, the thought that I have that, and I think I will start working on it at the beginning of 2021. My working title for it is Armies of Lovers. And I wanted to really be a big picture overview of LGBTQ activism in the United States from when it got started in the 50s until almost up to the present. And not a massive book that's several hundred pages long, but a book that will, again, will be easy to read um, and that will give the big picture um, so that uh, students and anybody could easily read the book. So that's my hope. Great. Um, in our time here, I wanna make sure we're, um, we're on schedule. Sure. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, hi, <laughs> so I'm hi. back. Uh, thank you both so much uh, for this incredible conversation if you want to keep going a little bit. Um, but I will jump in here to say that if the audience um, has any questions, uh, I'll go ahead and take the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion and conversation recently about erasure of history, and as specifically in the trans community. So I was wondering if you have found instances of that erasure and how you've been able to get around it, and mm -hmm. if there are. Um, some places where it's really unfortunate that that history has been erased. Well, yeah, let me let me respond to that in two different ways. One is that the erasure, meaning very little has been written so far relative to gay and lesbian, is is deep enough that I was I mean, I was really surprised by the trans history that I uncovered at the Gerber Hart Library because I thought I didn't, I didn't know this. Um, you know, for instance, uh, really, especially in the 
since the late 90s, but especially in the last 10 to 15 years, trans activism has become much more visible and you know, out there. But uh, within the Gerberhardt collections, there were stories, uh, there were materials about two different trans activist efforts that come from the early 1970s. Uh, in Chicago, for instance, as early as 1971, a group formed, um, and remember different words were used 50 years ago. Uh, so it was called uh, the Transvestite uh, Legal Committee. And it, it formed, apropos of what's going on in the present, it formed because the Chicago police had shot and killed in the back an unarmed trans woman that they had wanted to arrest for what was at that point called cross-dressing. And a number of trans individuals, trans women basically, in Chicago formed an organization called the Trans Legal Committee that for two or three years uh, did demonstrations outside gay bars that tried to keep transgender people out. They gave legal advice to trans people on how they could have documents changed about their identity and their name and things like that. So that to me was wow. Another example from the same period, something called a group called the Transvestite Information Service which was based of all places in rural North Carolina. And it was started by uh, uh, a, a man who was married to a woman, but who saw himself as trans and lived a life at home of wearing women's clothing so that she could be her true self. And she starts a correspondence network with others like her throughout the United States. Uh, individuals who to the world seem to be living the life of cisgender men, but among their family and among their friends, they have this other identity. And the fact that this was happening in the early 70s in small towns and rural communities around the United States was a great discovery to me. Um, in terms of the erasure, I mean, one of the ways in which it gets displayed is that, yes, I've told these two stories. And earlier when S Stephen was questioning me, we talk I talked about Robin Dupre, uh, a trans woman. But Gerber Hart does not have a lot of collections that are about trans lives and activism. And that's one of the things that needs to be actively sought out and worked to achieve is to begin finding older members of the community whose life stories will be very revealing. So yes, more needs to be done. Stephen, do you have uh, anything that you've come across? Well, I, I've i always you know, been challenged and when I speak to students, we talk about you know, using the modern prim prism is, is just very difficult to even use that to discuss uh, looking for trans history in here in St. Louis, looking at old news clips from you know the 1800s in which you find stories of, again, the masquerading laws being used to arrest people, to harass people. Um, but the trans term, which didn't exist then, does not allow us to um, go out on that limb to say, would this person have identified possibly as trans because it wasn't an option. Well, but we do know there are several cases and several stories which are very heart-wrenching where um, a couple of stories in which um, the person um, committed suicide. And so we have a, a history of, of a person being either arrested over and over or they were found. Um, there was a story of a, of, of a she presented as Rose um, and when her body was found, it was discovered um, um, and the family did not know that she was living in St. Louis as a woman, but she, she was originally from Kentucky in a small town and, and was known to the family as Stanley, but, um, but Rose committed suicide here in St. Louis. So, 
you know, the sensationalism of the newspaper stories are very tragic because we know that there's a life there and there's a journey there, but there's no, um, there's no journals, there's no um, diary, there's no photographs um, to tell that story. So there's just thousands of these stories across America and the world forever lost. And when we find these small little glimpses of the story, it, it's, it's very sad because we just know we're never gonna get the full story. Um, but we do have some glimpses that we can, can we should bring to light at least to, to raise the awareness of, of the difficulty of doing the, of doing the research. Uh, so Nan Nenora uh, is asking a question. Um, do you find that lesbian history differs significantly from that of gay men? If so, how does that affect your projects? For instance, my own early days were involved with lesbian feminism and Stonewall was not a known factor. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, in contrast to the, uh, the issue of trans erasure, the Gerber Hart Library has a large number of collections that are about lesbian activism and, and particularly about um, that period in the 70s and 80s uh, that often gets described as lesbian separatism. Uh, and and I've, I was able to take advantage of those collections and write about things like the Artemis Singers uh, or the various efforts to uh, form a lesbian community center in Chicago. Uh, and there was also something called uh, the Lesbian History, Ca History Calendar uh, that was created by an individual activist in Chicago. So there's the, the, one of the things that kind of emerged to me in looking at the various collections is that a significant part of lesbian feminist work in the 70s and early 80s, more so than among gay male activists, was the, the conscious effort, not just to engage in campaigns, but to build community through cultural work. So that there's much more creation of, whether it be a lesbian press or lesbian music groups or things like that, there seems to be much more effort in that period uh, to, to use culture uh, to bind people together and therefore create a community that can go out there and make change. Uh, Cameron is asking, are you worried at all about the ability of the next generation of LGBT historians to keep track of the endless information? Do you know any younger historians interested in this? Uh, well, th there, there's no question that there are uh, younger historians. I mean, because, uh, for, and as, just as an example of this, uh, the Organization of American Historians, and by American here, they mean people who do U.S. history, um, has uh, an award for the best dissertation written each year in LGBTQ history. And when that award was established, maybe four or five years ago, there was a real debate as to, well, should we offer it every year? Because there aren't going to be how many dissertations are written every year in this kind of history? Maybe we should offer it every two years or every three years. Well, let me tell you, there are enough dissertations submitted each year that it is, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it is a real competition. So there is a younger generation who is really out there doing work of, of all sorts. Uh, so I'm very hopeful about that. Um, and, and let's hope that as we move forward in time, that the history they're writing about isn't just about, isn't about the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, but is also about the 90s and the 2000s and, and the 2010s, because that's rapidly becoming history. And Stephen, do you have, because uh, I know that you work with Ian, uh, Darnell, sorry, Darnell, uh, quite a bit, who is a younger historian as well. Yes, and uh, with the um, um, Missouri History Museum, Missouri Historical Society here in St. Louis, and is doing 
great work helping them um, with their um, um, collecting initiative. Um, and as I work with students um, throughout St. Louis and um, on, on community projects, I'm sensing a lot of students very interested in the field, mm -hmm. uh, working with students right now at Webster University, doing some oral histories. Um, and they're all very, very intrigued by um, the concept of, of what I continue to call real-time history, which is, um, you know, let's go after, you don't have to be an older person to do an oral history with. I mean, you, um, a lot of the folks that I'm encouraging students to interview are younger folks, um, folks who are able to talk about their experiences with um, recent activism in St. Louis related to the Michael Brown um, murder and related to um, civil rights in St. Louis. So really encouraging um, younger folks to interview each other and interview um, um, about recent events. And, and not look at look at it as to be you have to go and do a story about something from 1950 or 60 as as um, John said. But let's 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 document history in real time as well. Um, thank you for bringing up the civil rights movement because I, 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 learning about the St. Louis history, I have been incredibly surprised the more I learn about both the historical civil rights movement and the one that's happening now. How many queer figures are we're leading and are leading those movements, and it's inspiring. Uh, we, we have a lot more questions. Sorry, <laughs> so wrapped up in the conversation. Uh, Andrea is asking: Did the collections at Gerber Hart make it possible to include stories about Black queer folk members of the Latinx or Puerto Rican community or other immigrants? Can you share a story or two from the book? Yes. Um, well. Uh, one example um, is, and I can I can give more than one, but one example is uh, Gerber Hart uh, has a collection from the organization Amigas Latinas, uh, which was an organization of women loving women uh, uh, Latinas that was formed in Chicago in 1995 and lasted for 20 years until 2015. And one of the things that's very exciting, and it's a huge collection, by the way, there's so much that can be researched. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the uh, areas that they took on is that, well, from the beginning, they worked to increase the acceptance and the press and the presence of Latinx women in the LGBT community but to also increase the presence of lesbian and bisexual women in the Latinx community. Um, so they were working in both ways. And one of the issues that they took on was immigration uh, to make the queer community realize that immigration is an LGBT issue, but to also make their home ethnic community realize, you know, the LGBT people among us face added barriers around immigration. So, so their collection is, is just wonderful in kind of telling the stories. It really, it truly represents intersectionality lived out. Um, another collection um, that, in, that I write about and that Gerber Hart has, uh, they're the papers of two individuals um, uh, Wendell Reed, and I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the name of the other one right now, but their papers are both, both of their collections are about their work. They're both African-American men, and it's about their work in the organization Black and White Men Together, which was formed in 1980. And I think in the, quote, public mind in the community, Black and White Men Together was often seen as just a social group. It's a way that you know, men who experience sexual attraction across racial lines have a safe place to meet together and don't have to deal with the discrimination in bars and things like that. But going through the papers about black and white men together, the, it was formed in 1980. Well, the AIDS epidemic starts the next year and it disproportionately affects African-American men. And black and white men together do so much community education and activism around AIDS. And 
the papers that they have at Gerber Hart are not just about Chicago. Uh, they tell you what's going on in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and things like that. And it's a truly impressive story about uh, act, interracial activism. Uh, Andrea, a little plug for Love Bank Books. Uh, next Friday, there is going to be an event for Paolo Ramos uh, for her book, Latin, Finding Latinx. And that is about queer conversations throughout the entire country, including Chicago and St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, the book actually ends in St. Louis. And uh, we will be doing that event uh, live. Uh, so that's going to be something of interest to this crowd as well. And I'm really excited about that event too. I'm very excited about this event happening right now. <laughs> um, Kayla is asking, how do you think we can uncover or make up for this erasure of LGBTQ plus experiences, if at all? What can younger activist generations do to rediscover this lost history or write our own? Yeah, well, one thing that can be done would be a form of activism in itself. Um, and I say this from the experience of now of living in Illinois, where uh, I think it was in, it was either two or three years ago that the Illinois state legislature, based on intensive organizing and lobbying by LGBT organizations across the state, passed a curriculum inclusion law that mandates that the public schools throughout the state include LGBTQ material in the curriculum of middle schools and high schools. Uh, and that could be in literature courses, but a lot of it is going to be in history and social studies courses. Uh, and having a law like that opens the door to, well, guaranteeing that young people will get at least some information uh, that will teach them about this history. Uh, and no matter what their identity is, if it's in the general school system. Uh, but a second effect of it is that it, when you have a law like that, it really provides a spur to more people doing the research so that materials are available to teach in the public schools. Uh, so uh, I know Illinois, California, I think Massachusetts also has a curriculum mandate. There may be a handful of other schools. Uh, I'm assuming that Missouri doesn't. Uh, and it would be a wonderful thing to you know, make that a goal, even as unlikely as it seems that it might be achieved um, you have to get there somehow. So that's, that's one of the ways in which we can make sure that more of this history is out there and available to people. And Stephen, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yes, and I hope, you know, generational, you know, um, growth and change assist with that as well. Um, I, we, a lot of us still run into elders who are still not comfortable telling those stories publicly. And so we do, that's why I really do encourage younger people to um, become engaged. Um, and I love the kind of mentoring concept of oral histories where um, you pair up um, an older and a younger person together um, and create a relationship. And that it's maybe not just a one-time interview um, where you can um, maybe have a series of interviews and the people get to know each other um, and, and kind of have a relationship but I do um, have hope that um, as technology has advanced, that um, the ability to do histories, um, A, it's easier, and I think it's sort of expected now. So I, I'm very optimistic that it will become a norm to, um, to um, do history um, in real time and to capture, um, as we do events, we automatically preserve the digital graphics that are designed and. Um, the online discussions, um, the recording of tonight, all of those things get archived someplace safe um, for the future. So I'm optimistic. I'm not so optimistic about Missouri having its own um, queer curriculum. But I won't hold my breath. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and 
I had something to input, but I, uh, as a former bartender at a queer bar, like talking to so many of the people that had been in the community for so much longer than I was, it was always so enlightening. So for anyone watching tonight, I, I mean, become a gay bartender. Uh, it's a great for learning gay history. <laughs> yeah. Big <laughs> Uh, Mary has another question, or uh, first question for Mary. I'm fascinated by this discussion of building community through cultural work. I'm curious if you found any link between the kinds of cultural work people engaged in and the political activism that emerged from it. In other words, did you find it mattered whether groups formed as choruses or as softball teams, etc.? Well, uh, here's, I'll, I'll give the example of Artemis Singers in uh, Chicago, which was a, a women's choral group that formed around 1980 and actually still exists today. So it's been around now for 40 years. Um, and one of the things that having Artemis Singers exist accomplished is that activist organizations or other kinds of lesbian community organizations that needed financial support, they would organize a concert that the Artemis singers would give and it became, you know, in which it became a fundraiser that would raise thousands of dollars for these commun lesbian community organizations that were existing on the margins financially. And not only did it raise money, but the fact that the concert was held brought often brought over the years, but as early as the 80s, brought hundreds of lesbians together in a common space, which in the early 1980s for that to happen really provided a contradiction to the isolation that many women loving women experience. So a cultural organization like Artemis really helps build uh, more political organizations and other kinds of community-based organizations. And in that sense is really connected to the world of activism. And I know from a little bit of experience at the bookstore that when you have like a reunion of these teams mm. you can really see like oh like these are the faces that i see like working today working hard for the rights of lgbtq people and representing and they've been doing it for years so yeah it's the choruses the uh softball teams the um oh uh, what is it here in st louis that was um the out um uh, Stephen, you might have to help me. The uh, sports league that. Yeah, I'm now. I can't think of the name. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris, the co-owner of the bookstore, was one of the amazing, amazing um, network of sports teams here in St. Louis. Yeah, <laughs> Chris, if you're watching, I'm sorry, sorry that I can't think of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it really is um, incredible to see how much they're still active and. Activism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right. I, it, we might have time for another question. So if anyone has another question, but the audience, thank you so much for asking such wonderful questions this evening. Yes. Yeah. And I want to go ahead and thank both of you for doing the work that you do. Um, I know that I've gotten to witness a lot of Stephen's work both firsthand and in the books. And I mean, reading Stephen's book and reading your book, John, it's incredible to see these stories of inspiration and hope and longevity of how much people have worked for our rights and how kind of fragile those rights are. So yes, it helps it helps make me a better activist and a more inspired activist. So I want to thank both of you for your work. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you, Stephen, for asking these questions. <laughs> it was a great opportunity to be able to talk about the book, which has just come out this month. So 
Yeah. No, I, I was honored and it's a real pleasure to finally meet you, um, even though it's virtual and hopefully in a post COVID world, we can meet in person and, and I would enjoy that. Yes. And a reminder to everyone watching that uh, both books are available for sale. Um, John, your book actually comes out tomorrow. Uh, so it should be on our shelves as of tomorrow and available to ship out to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. If you have friends that are uh, particularly interested in uh, either histories, now is a great time to start your holiday shopping. <laughs> You can start thinking about like Halloween because I mean, I know that in St. Louis, Halloween has a uh, long history in the LGBT community, which is fantastic. Um, but it's a very important time to start thinking about buying for the holidays and who you're going to give your gifts to. Uh, we do have oh, from oh, Ellen. We got it. We got it, Shane. We, uh, <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> we, got, we got the um, name of the team, St. Louis. Team St. Louis. Oh, Team St. Louis. So oh, yeah. Chris, forgive us. It's Team St. Louis. Thanks to Charles Cole for saving us. Uh, we will end with um, Alan. Alan Leeds are, is the moderator for the Gay Men's Reading Group, so we will end with one of his questions, appropriately. Uh, how long has Chicago had an LGBT community center? Uh, well, they, they, it, this community centers have come and gone. Uh, so uh, the first ones were established in the 1970s, but it was all volunteer labor and then they would go. Uh, the first lesbian community centers started at the end of the 70s and early 80s and they would go as well. Uh, right now we have something in Chicago called uh, the Center on Halstead uh, and it grows out of earlier efforts uh, that go back to the 70s, but then it's it has a huge space. Uh, it's open to the public and it formed, it opened on, in Halstead I, more than a dozen years ago at this point now. So, uh, and it seems to be a very stable organization that provides lots of different community services. All right, well, I think we will wrap it up there. Thank you both so much for this incredible conversation. Audience, thank you for being here tonight with us and for um, supporting these wonderful books. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. It's been Thanks. good. All right, and we will see you next time. Okay.